Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Cisco, and we are live from our main office here at the Church Triumphant, 1030 Strawberry Road in Pasadena, Texas. And this is another edition of our High Noon Prayer broadcast. We welcome you to all of our Church Triumphant family, to those who are so faithful every single week to join with us, whether you're joining with us live, whether you're joining with us at a later time, we welcome you, whether it's Facebook or whether it's YouTube, we thank you for watching and for even more just participating, opening up your heart, opening up your spirit, aligning yourself with God and bringing to bear the power of the church when it's in session. So I appreciate you so very much. We love you. Church Triumphant family, you are absolutely amazing. We are on a journey and we are headed into a season of effectiveness and a season of fruitfulness like we have never seen before. We realize that everything that is worthwhile is worth paying the price for. Some say, what a price that needs to be paid. Others say, but what a purchase but look what I got. And this is how we view our destiny, our purpose. This is how we view the responsibility that has been given to us, the authority that God has delegated to us. We do not see it just as something that is the suffering, the fellowship of suffering, but we see that out of that fellowship of suffering comes the power of resurrection and that fellowship in the power of his resurrection in our lives. So we welcome you to all of our uh, friends, to all of our partner churches, partner ministries, 501c3s, our missionaries, all of our pastors, those that are leaders around the United States and Canada, Central America, South America that are joining in with us. We welcome you in the North and the Northeast, the South, the Southwest, the Southeast. God bless you all the way up to the Northwest. Thank you so much. All different parts of America that join with us on a consistent basis. Amazing. We love you. God bless you. To all of our international friends and partners and missionaries, we love you in Europe and Asia and uh, South Africa, all the way uh, to Australia. We have many in Australia that connect with us and some in even New Zealand that are connecting with us. The Philippines and India that connects with us. Uh, for those that are that are all across Asia, God bless you. Thank you so much. Many watch at different times because of the time zone difference. But we are so joyous every time we see a connection with our international partners joining with us here uh, in our national on our national partners and our local level. So God bless you. So I'm seeing uh, Mexico joining in there, Los Angeles joining in. God bless you. Gloria Santo, Alleluia, Hase Nombre, Gloria. So we praise the Lord today. We're so thankful. Gloire à Dieu to all of our French speakers. And um, we could just keep going today. Shalom, shalom uh, to everyone. Shalom Alechem. So we are talking this week and about really increasing our potency as believers, as disciples, as followers of Christ. How can we increase our effectiveness? I think this is a question that we ask and we have to just keep on asking. And so the first part of this is directly tied to our willingness to keep walking with God. And that walking with God directly ties to words that are contrary to the flesh. Words like submission, words like obedience, um, words like brokenness, surrender, transparency, humility, words like forgiveness. These are, are, are powerful, transformative words, and it's seeing through redemptive eyes. It's seeing things through redemptive eyes. The redemptive eyes of God to remedy the sin problem in the soul and to restore us back to what we could be and then add to it what he says we we can be not just what we could be but also what we can be it is to take away the effects of sin and then it is to uh, make us whole and then add to that the blessing 
of going beyond what any of those that have gone before us have accomplished and experienced. These are the goals that we have. These are the desires that we have. But in order to get there, again, in my opening words, oh, there's a price to be paid. But what is the purchase of that price? So why do I so often open my broadcast with prayers of submission and surrender and alignment? Because these are the daily essentials. We are what we consistently do. You are what you consistently say. Your brain will actually adjust to what you do and what you say. Even if your thoughts are opposite. I don't want to work out right now. I don't want to get I don't want to get on the treadmill right now. I don't want to, you know, eat kale or well, I don't want all those things we don't want to do. Our brain is thinking that, but if I say, no, nope, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I say it out loud, I'm gonna do it, and I keep doing it, something happens. The neural pathways in my brain say, Well, if if he's gonna do that, then let's make it easier for him. And so they turn off other synapses and turn on other synapses. This is what happens in the brain. Uh, in our development stage, and then it can be reordin- reorganized your entire life, new synapses, new neural pathways can be created because the brain is the servant to the mind. The brain is the servant to the mind. So what are we doing? We're going to come back. We're going to come back and we're going to keep submitting ourselves to God. We're going to keep repenting. We're going to keep getting up again. We're going to keep trying another day. And so this is why I do it so consistently why I want you to pray the armor on every single day and why I ask you to listen to God and give space in your time to listen to God and have a consciousness of God. So we're praying about a consciousness of God. And what I do in the broadcast is to try to speak to you what is the flow of the spirit. I don't have a lot of notes. You know that when I preach, I don't preach with notes. I don't teach with a lot of notes. Every now and then I'll have a few things written down depending on the subject or what the, you know, if it's a quote or et cetera. But that's even more when I'm teaching or training. But for the majority of the time, I'm getting in the spirit. I'm taking the word of God and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to breathe upon it because I don't want to just be my words. This is my prayer and I'm going to pray it today and I'm going to ask you to pray it with me. I want to be eclipsed by the spirit. I want you to say that. Say, eclipse me, Jesus. Eclipse me. So we talk about an eclipse from the perspective of the moon uh, getting right in, sh- in front of the sun and because of the shape of the moon and the shape of the sun, uh, there is an outline of the sun, and your and then there's this beautiful, perfect, what we call eclipse, which which can be which can be seen for that exact moment of that perfect alignment, whether it's two minutes or whatever it is, as that is that kind of across as across America or across Europe or wherever it is that the that that the eclipse can be seen for those moments, and people set up their their cameras just for that two minutes, and I think sometimes. This is about how much we have. We're, we're trying to get into that alignment. And, and just for that two minutes when I'm perfectly aligned with God, it is historic moment. And so this is what we're building for. This is what we're praying for, is we're praying to get into that perfect alignment with God. But instead of us being in front of him as the son, we literally want him to be in front of us, that they just see him. And if I can get into that dimension, we call that the seventh dimension. You may not be able to live there, but if you can be there for moments, moments where the glory of God uh, eclipses us, eclipses me, eclipses you, where we can be completely swallowed up, that is the goal. And so this is what we are praying for. And I, I've told this story early on uh, in, the, in, in the COVID when we first started praying online. I told a story about this and I'll come back and tell it to you again. Um, and describe an experience that I had that maybe put it into better context. But first, let's do that for the, those prayers. Let's pray those prayers because this is what we all desire. This is what we need. The more you see me, the more you hear me, the easier it is for you to get bored, for you to, uh, for you to easily find a fault or you know, for things to just lose its, lose its, it's the nature of, of, of all of life is to gradually go away. Uh, to walk away, to drift away. And so we, we, we gird up the loins of our mind, as Job said. We gird up the loins of our mind. God said in Job, stand up like a man. Gird up your loins like a man. This is what we're doing. We're gathering ourselves together. And we're, again, putting ourselves in the right position. Father, there are so much, there are so much stimuli around us. There are so many things happening between holiday preparations, between the news 
uh, that, that, that between uh, what's actually going on right now this week, whether uh, there are court hearings or Supreme Court rulings or, or whether it's uh, different evidence is being presented or being excluded or God, there's so much that's around us. People praying, people having prophetic words, dreams and visions, people weighing in, news media saying uh, what they say. Just there's so much distraction. There is also the physical uh, issues of COVID that people are still feeling, and we're praying for several in our in our local church right here that are that are still battling with COVID, are still coming out and overcoming it. Father, we 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 know people around the world that are still dealing with this. There's the lockdowns, the shutdowns. There's there's the economy. God, there's so much that's there. But really, the biggest issue that we all have, Father, and I'm starting with me. The biggest issue is me. The biggest issue is myself, Lord. I need you, oh God, more than I even can can comprehend. I need you as much as you are God and as much as I am a man. That is how much I need you, Father. This is how much, oh God, I, I have to get on my face every day because I feel, oh God, the deceptiveness of my own heart. I know the weakness of my own flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And so, Lord, the, the flesh cannot be trained. It must be crucified. I come to you today again. I deny myself. I deny myself because I know where that path goes. And my carnal mind fights against those words. It defends its position. It fights for its own way. But even in the fighting, it also explains itself and proves that your word is true. The, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So, Lord, I want to be pleasing to you. I want you to say that to him right now. Say, God, I want to be pleasing to you. I want to be pleasing to you, God. I want to operate in faith. I want to operate in the spirit. I want to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, Lord, today we take the cross again. We deny ourselves and we pick up our cross and we say, not my will, but your will be done. We say, not my way, but your way. Not my mind, not my thoughts. Oh, God, your thoughts. Now, here's a great prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Jesus... Erase me. Say, don't let them see my face. Let them see your face. Don't let them hear my words. Let them hear your words. Let it not be my hand, but let it be your hand. Let it not be, oh God, my spirit, but let it be your spirit. Not my emotion, but your emotion, Father. Not my thoughts, your thoughts. Eclipse me, Lord. Take me over. I submit myself to you, spirit and soul and body. Help me to see all of the stimuli. Help me to see all the things that are hitting me. And help me, oh God, to, to be drawn in again. To be reset again, oh God. To, to have the resolve that is necessary. Give me the determination to do your will, God, and not waver. Help me, oh God, to be consistent. Help me to be faithful, oh God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you lift your hands to him? And would you love him now? Thank you, Jesus, right where you are. Lift your hands to him and love him. Let the Holy Spirit just speak right where you are. Right where you are. If you're in a, if you're in a quiet place or you're in a private place or in your own home, go ahead and let the Holy Spirit just begin to speak out of you. Let it flow. Just speak in tongues right now as the Spirit of God just directs you. It's so important for us to let the Spirit pray through us because we don't even know what we need sometimes. We don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. We're the sons of God and it prays for us. It intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Hello, they are shukuyim on the satai. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, I've been focusing this week on the importance of each one of us not being watered down in our Christianity, not being watered down in our message, 
not being watered down in our lifestyle, not standing in a, a compromised position. And so we, we can get, look at the example. In the last days, he said it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of Lot, or it will be like the days of Noah, in which the imagination of every man was evil continually. In the days of Noah, there was great violence. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, there was great perversion. There was also, on a sidebar, a lot of pride, self-interest, selfishness, greed. And the Bible says the sins of Sodom, the greatest sins of Sodom, was not their homosexuality and lesbianism, their perversion. That was not what even was mentioned by the prophets. It was the fact that they ignored the poor and the oppressed. Is that they threw them out of their city and said, we don't want any of you here because they were so greedy and they were so full of pride. So we can see in these generations, these last days, when we look at it, uh, we can see that there is a, there's a, there are parallels. There are things that we have to address in ourselves as the church. What did God need Noah to do? He needed him to be consistent in his message to preach righteousness. He preached righteousness. He did not preach condemnation. The Bible says he found grace in the eyes of the Lord and he preached righteousness. He told people we need to be righteous. We need to be right with God. And he did it for a hundred years and told them judgment is coming. Rain is coming. There's going to be a flood. It's going to destroy the earth. Only the righteous are going to be saved. Here's the way. And so there's one door into the ark. And then there were three layers inside of that ark. The one door to the ark is Jesus. There is only one door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's not many spokes that all lead to the center of the wheel. There is only one way to God, and that is Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see inside is there were three levels. So what did Jesus do for us? His death, his burial, his resurrection. So it's that gospel message. How do we identify with that gospel? We repent. We are baptized in the name of Jesus. We receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38, the first message, tells us and explains what the gospel is and how we obey the gospel. Noah found grace, which gave him the truth, which allowed him to have a plan that he could believe in. And that plan stimulated his obedience. And through his obedience to God in building the ark, he was able to be saved. Grace by itself did not save him. Grace created a path for him to be saved and for all those who would hear him to be saved. Grace plus truth plus faith plus obedience equals salvation. So when we talk about the days of Lot, we also see something else here, is that we see the pressure of the world bearing down upon us that is constantly eroding our spirituality, eroding our faith, eroding our, our senses, eroding our, our, our ability to, to really get in the spirit. So we have Lot who is, who is considered righteous but he's in a compromised position. But thankfully, because of Abram, who was later Abraham, who became the friend of God, he was able to intercede and he was able to pull Lot out and he was able to reinstate him to a righteous state. So his end result was that he was acknowledged as righteous, but he, he lost a lot in the process because he had no longer been effective. He did not win one soul in Sodom. Sodom did not have a Bible. All they had was a believer. Sodom had no Bible. And that's why the Bible says that if the works that were done in Chorazin had, and in Bethsaida had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have stayed. They would have repented, Jesus said. They didn't get to see any miracles. They didn't have it. He said, but you, Chorazin, you're going to be brought down to hell because you saw the miracles. Christ himself walked in your streets and you rejected him. He said, so Sodom and Gomorrah did not have that. They didn't have a Bible. They had one family, and that family had lost its potency. They had lost their effectiveness. The salt had lost its savor. And so they did not affect Sodom. Sodom affected them. 
There was not one convert that Lot made. Instead, Sodom absorbed all of Lot's family. He lost his daughters and he lost his wife. He was the only one that survived. His two daughters that remained committed incest with him and their children became the enemies of Israel. It was the children of Ammon and the children of Moab. This is what happens when we lose our effectiveness, when the world influences us, we end up giving birth to something that has partially the DNA of, of God and partially the DNA of the world. And this only leads to a 100% enemy. That's why God says to Ephraim, you're a cake half turned. You're burned on one side. The other side is raw. Nobody wants a pancake that's never been flipped. Who wants to eat a pancake that's raw on one side? Ugh. God says, I can't handle it. This is what he says about, about Laodicea. You're lukewarm. I, uh, you're half. You're mixed. So on the northern part of Laodicea, there was a beautiful stream that was cold and refreshing. In the southern part of Laodicea, there were the hot springs. But in the middle of the city, the cold springs would meet the hot springs. And the minerals mixed in with the cold springs caused the water to be lukewarm. And it would taste horrible. It was something you would just spit out of your mouth. And he says, I would rather you be a refreshing spring or a healing, uh, uh, or I'd rather you be a refreshing river or a healing spring, but all this mixing makes you lose all of your potency. God is saying for the church in the last days is that he wants us to be that consistent voice of righteousness. He wants us to be that friend of God that is not drawn in by the world, but rather we can have a say about what goes on. So Abraham is up in the mountain. Lot is compromised, but Abraham is able to pray and angels are able to come in and he actually negotiates the judgment of that city. So for us to say, hey, we live in a corrupt world, is that new news? We're living in a day today of violence, of people that are unhinged, out of control. They're imposing their, their will upon us. You know, they're knocking at the door saying, let us in. You know, we're going we're gonna to rape those men. Uh, you know, we, we want to do what we want to do and you're not going to stop us. And I mean, I mean you, you see this pressure. You see this, this complete commitment to wickedness. Well, is that new? It's been in the world since the world began. We're looking around and we're seeing all kinds of wickedness and evil around us. Well, these are the days of Lot. And that's what we say. No, no, no. We have to step back and say, what can I do about it? How is it affecting me? At the end of the day, I can only affect what I can affect. I can only change what I can change. And it starts with me. It starts with my submission to God. It starts with my obedience to God. It starts with me saying, God, I need you to eclipse me, erase me. Because the more that I try, the more that I do it in the flesh, the, the less effective that, I'm, that I am. Let's go to the book of Acts for a minute and let's think about it. Take out all of the supernatural acts of the book of Acts. Do you know what you have left? You have 5%. 5% of the book of Acts in every chapter except one. There is a supernatural event, every chapter except one. And the one chapter where it's not, there's a great controversy where people are fighting over a mentality about the Gentiles. So folks, let me tell you, let me tell you, where the Holy Spirit is not working, we end up having a lot of flesh, a lot of division, a lot of opinions. We end up being divided and we have to work really hard to just pray, get over ourselves and come to a spiritual conclusion a spiritual agreement. If we were to take the Holy Spirit out of our churches and out of our practices, out of our lives, what would be left? In a lot of churches, you would not even know that anything changed because 95% of what we do is done in the flesh. If we took the Holy Spirit out, well, we would still do the majority of what we do. This cannot be the narrative of the end time church. This is not what God has called the church triumphant to be. And when I say that, I say it more than the local church, but I am saying directly to our local church. God called us to be more than that. Your faith does not stand in the wisdom of men. It stands in the power of God. If it stands in the power of God, then that means it has to be a consistent part of our lives. The power of God, the demonstration of the Spirit. And what does that require? That requires me getting past myself on a consistent basis. That's why if any man be a disciple of mine, Jesus says, 
deny himself daily, pick up the cross and follow me. I used to see the cross. I used to see it as a wall, as something that I hit up against. Now I see it as a door that opens and allows me to get, get into a place I could not get into. I used to see it as a limitation. Now I see it as actually a magnification. The cross actually allows me to leave flesh behind so that my spirit can soar. It leaves the natural behind to enter the supernatural. It ends the smaller myself and I enter into the great I am. I get past who I am by myself and I get into the I am of who he is in me. Lift your hands and thank him for it again right now. Would you do it? Everything that we need is already in the spirit. Everything that we need is already in the church. Now let me give you a definition for the world again, okay? This is just a little reminder. It's for me and a reminder for my flesh and a reminder for all of us today. The world is whatever can exist without direct dependence upon God. Whatever can exist without direct dependence upon God is the world. So the church, for the church to exist, it must have daily bread. For me to continue on my relationship with God, I must abide in the vine. I must abide in him and his words have to abide in me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth, continues to proceed out of the mouth of God. I've got to stay in the flow of the word. Pray without ceasing means God consciousness. If I'm not in God consciousness, I drift. If we are not daily in the spirit, then we drift. We become weak because we are weekly and not daily. We, we, we are inconsistent. And he says, don't think that that man is double-minded, is going to receive anything from God. And so this is the reason why our prayers aren't effective. This is the reason why we complain and why we're immature and we're not really spiritually minded. is because we are too inconsistent. And so I have to go back and I have to go back again and again and again until all of those areas that are, that are out of control are submitted to God and they're brought back into the governorship of Christ. This is why Paul said, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest after I've preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. I don't want to just preach it to somebody else. I've got to live it. Jason Sisko has to live this. Whether I have a broadcast or not, I have to live this. You have to live this life. And see, when I live it, when I, I do the hard work, when I do the hard emotional work and I get down to why did I have that reaction, when I do the hard work of, of expecting God to work in my thought life and I see those thoughts that are opposite of God and I say, okay, where's that coming from? When I do the hard work of, of why am I not wanting to obey or why is it so hard for me to do this or why am I so stubborn about that? When I do that hard work, his work in me, that crucifying of myself and that pain of truth brings about a transformation. And Paul said, I travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. It's time to get salty. <laughs> it's time to be salty. And I know that that has a lot of innuendo in it, but I mean it in the very practical and, and most simple way is that we are the salt of the earth. That's what we are. When you look at the Beatitudes, each one of them is a progression of more influence. Poor in spirit shows emptiness, but they get the kingdom. Those who mourn are mourning the, uh, their, their bad condition of what they, have, what they aren't, what they should have been, but what they aren't. They're mourning their sins, and now they're comforted by forgiveness. Now the humble, what are they? The meek, they're going to inherit the earth. So now what's happening? Now, uh, now I'm getting an inheritance Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now I'm filled with righteousness. They will be filled. Now blessed are the merciful. I am so full of righteousness. I have an inheritance. Now what is this? I can extend mercy to someone. Now it's not a gap. It's not something that I'm mourning. It's not an emptiness. It's, it's not my poverty. But now I have the wealth of my inheritance. I'm able to give mercy because I'm operating in righteousness. 
Those blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Now the pure in heart, they will see God. Now suddenly, I'm seeing in the spirit. I'm able to see the kingdom. I'm able to walk in a dimension of vision. Now I'm a peacemaker. I can walk into that situation. And because there's restraint, because there's righteousness, because I'm, I have mercy and because I can see in the spirit, now I'm able to come into a situation and I can put out all of the flames of adversity and divisiveness, and I can walk in and create peace, and I'll be called a son of God. They'll say, wow, only a son of God could do that. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of God is theirs. What is this? I'm persecuted now because I am so pungent, that I am so powerful, the life of Jesus is so strong that those who oppose him recognize it in me and so they are attacking the God in me. They're attacking the righteousness in me. They're attacking the conviction that comes by just my presence being in that room. And we are persecuted because they, we are so submitted. Blessed are you when you have when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you. They can't say anything that's true about you because your record is so proven. He said, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. You have grown from poor in spirit, having nothing, to now being so powerful that the only thing that the wicked can do is try to fight you and attack you. They can't say anything about you that's true that is not submitted. So all they can do is make stuff up. That's why he says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it may be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So what they did when the salt no longer had any value, they would use it to fill in the gaps in the streets. They would just take the, the salt and put it out in the road. You are filler for the road. You're just going to be trampled on. What he says, if you don't have any saltiness, then you know what's going to happen? You're going to be a road. You're going to be a road. You're just going to be rolled over. You're just going to be walked on. People that don't have any salt, that don't have any conviction, that don't have any that don't have any truth in them, people that are not mature, that are not walking in the fullness of the, uh, of the grace of God that is available to us. If we are not living in, in, living in the will of God and doing his will, you know what happens? We might be, we might be lot. We might be lot. We might be called righteous, but the world just rolls right over us. Now here's the hope. The hope is through intercession and prayer, God can pull out the lots of this world, pull us out of that influence and reinstate us as righteous. But what do we lose? What is being lost? And we have to see what is being lost in Christendom today. What is being lost in the world today of those who represent Christ across the board, across all denominations? What is happening to us when the Pope now is 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 so inclusive, he's saying gay marriage is sanctioned by the church. What has happened to our world when that kind of pressure has created that kind of that kind of obvious, that kind of obvious override of the word of God? So we have to say, why are we going to be persecuted as Christians? Because there's going to be some Christians that really have the B attitudes. It's not just what we do, it's it's not just doing it's being its identity it's what resides within us i've I, I i've been in that position with god where i've where i've where i've had the eclipsing of his presence in my life and this is what i want more than anything i realize every single day in my prayers in the morning when i go to sleep at night the biggest fear that any pastor has any minister has the biggest fear that any saint of god should have is that we would wake up and not be effective. We would wake up and our prayers no longer have any traction. Our testimony no longer has any authenticity to it. Our words have no life. Our prayers have no meaning. And we are just doing what we do out of tradition. Oh, it's just salt that's lost its saltiness. And it's just thrown out into the street. Oh God, oh God. Let us have the saltiness, the saltiness that you intended for us, that, that where everything is bland, oh God, when we come, we create the taste. We are, we are where, where the appetite of the soul is what really looking for. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We want people to know who you are. 
And so, God, I want you to take me beyond myself. Take me beyond myself. Only I, I can only control. I can only, I can only affect what happens in me. And then once I'm in the will of God, I can pray in the will of God. And whatever I pray in the will of God, I want to pray with authority and effectiveness. Now, I'm going to tell you a story here in just a minute. But I want to say one more thing in the flow of the Spirit right now. And I think it's very important for me to say this. The Holy Ghost is really, really talking to me right now. It is extremely important that the enemy does not take these words that are meant to encourage and also to reveal and use them as a righteous weapon to beat you or to beat me up. If I see an area that I need to grow in, if I see an area that God is saying, I want you to be more effective. Uh, let me give you an example, a recent example for me. When we had Charles Robinette with us, great man of God, and those of you watching in Germany, I hope you can connect with him. Uh, great man of God. He told a story about how when they were going into Bangladesh, there was a, a small flight from the major city that they were in. They were flying into the city where the crusade was going to be. There was about 90 people on the little plane. 30 or more of them were apostolic people. He said, when we hit the ground, he said, I want you to speak in tongues as loud as you can. I want you to praise God and worship God. Now, obviously, this was a directive from the Holy Ghost. This was a word of wisdom that was given to him that they were supposed to do this. And I say that because I don't know that if we do not have a direction from the Holy Ghost, if it's going to have the right effect that it's supposed to have. But in this case, this is what God told them to do. And they began to worship at the top of their lungs. As soon as those wheels hit the ground, they began to speak in tongues out loud and worship. And people began to weep on that plane. Muslims came to them and said, I have I have served Allah and prayed every day for years and never felt anything. This is the first time I felt something. What is it that you have? Who is this God that you serve? And they said, let me tell you, his name is Jesus. And they prayed for the flight attendants, people all around them. I want to say it was like five people, I think, that got the Holy Ghost on the plane. I heard that story and I thought, wow, God, I have been all over the world. I don't know if I would have the boldness and the courage to be that salty. I don't know if I, if I would be able to do that. And that was a conviction for me that says I have to be willing that if God puts me in this environment, that I'd be willing to do that, that I'd be willing to be that loud on a commercial airliner and speak in tongues regardless of what uh, somebody would say about that. You only do that with a directive because you can give uh, Christianity, or you could give Pentecostalism, or you could give, you could give Jesus um, actually uh, uh, a bad name if you if you did it outside of the direction of the Holy Ghost. But I'm saying in obedience, I believe that I would. I I, I want to hope that if I have that impression with the Lord, that I would not worry about what the outcome would be. But I can see there in my own self. I ask the question: Would I be that salty? Am I willing? Would I be willing to do that? Revival happened in the early church, not just when there were miracles in the temple, but when they raised up a cripple on the street at the gate beautiful, that's when the miracle happened. I wonder what would happen if we had miracles in the streets. I wonder if maybe this is what God is doing with having limited occupancy in our buildings as churches. He's trying to get us from being shut up in a church and he's trying to get us all motivated and mobilized where miracles can happen in the streets. It can happen in the homes. They can happen out in the public space. Maybe the reason why God squeezes me, as he told me he would do online, is this an uncomfortable thing for me to be on Facebook. And I say, everybody and anybody can watch this. This is not in the context of a service. And here I am crying and blubbering and praying and doing all these things. It doesn't matter because I'm called to be light and I'm called to be salt. This is what we're called to do. So, so But the point that I want to make on this is that, is that God is always speaking to that in us. He's always speaking to that. We cannot let the enemy make us say, if I am not this, then I am not anything. And so I don't want to turn it around and cancel out all of the effectiveness of my prayers or all of the effectiveness of my intercession or all the effectiveness of my words because there's still an area of growth in my life. That is not what this means. 
I call this the Elijah syndrome. Elijah called down fire from heaven, killed 450 prophets, prayed until it rained, ran faster than a chariot, but felt like a total failure because Jezebel survived that day. Sometimes we don't even count. The enemy hit him so hard and made him feel like a total failure. And sometimes the enemy will say, see, you aren't able to do that, or you can't do that, or see, you've lost your saltiness, or you're not a good witness, or you're not effective. And then he tries to get you to give up all the ground that you have because the one area that you wanted still didn't happen yet. So don't let the enemy do that. I feel this impression of the Holy Ghost. I had a vision many years ago. I had been interceding and praying for this city in Kentucky. I'd spent a lot of time there. And I was praying against the prince of that city and I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere and I prayed hours and hours and I'd fasted and we had had, we had, had some results in that church and uh, they would ask me to come back and preach again and again and I preached several times in the area. And, and so I, but I, I wanted, I had this high bar of what I was expecting God to do and, and I just didn't know if I was being effective and not and I was starting to get depressed and, and I was feeling like I, that, that I, it was a waste of my time and and, and, and I poured myself out. And when will I ever have an effective ministry and be effective in prayer? And God showed me a vision. I was talking to the Lord about this. And God showed me a vision. And there was a, there was a, a screen that had been stretched out in front of me. And there were demons on either side of the screen that were holding up this, uh, this background. It would be like what you would have at a drama or a play. When they, you know, they drop those, a Broadway play or whatever, or a school auditorium. They drop backgrounds down. And you don't know what's happening behind there because there's a background. And so the, the Lord was showing me that they had dropped this background and that I was only seeing this background. And I was thinking that that was the real spirit world is this background and nothing seemed to have changed. And then the final uh, blow came and the Lord said the last layer that the enemy holds on to is that, is, is that image. So this is the last stronghold that he has is that he does not want you to see what's really happening. Because if you ever see behind it, you'll be so encouraged, you'll have so much boldness, that you'll pray more effectively, you'll have more faith than you've ever had. And he says, so he puts all of his energy just to keep this in front of you, to make you think that, there's, that you're not effective. He said, it's his last stand. And then suddenly I saw the thing just fall. And when I saw it fall, I looked behind and about every three foot, it looked like a bomb had hit that area. The whole land behind me was smoking on a fire. It was, and it was like, this is, this is how thorough the attack has been. This is how effective your, your prayers have been. This is the real truth of what you've done in this region. And the enemy did not want you to know this is how defeated he actually is. So he was trying to keep you from this last knowledge. The last thing he wants is for you to see it. So I want to tell you on the, this side of it, that many of you have been so effective. You have been, you've been praying and doing so much, but you still have not seen everything that you want to see yet, but there's something in front of you. The enemy is constantly trying to show you nothing has changed. Nothing has happened. We haven't made any, any inroads. We have no idea. We still have no idea how effective we have been. We have been way more effective. The 40 days of prayer and fasting. You know, the enemy tried to tell me, oh, it's already wore off. You've done as much damage as you can do. You know, it lasted about one or two weeks. That's it. That's it. That's all it's done. So, you know, you, 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 you're a failure. You didn't get anything done. You didn't accomplish what you wanted. Oh, no, no. We have not even seen the half of what God is going to do from what we have already put in motion. Not to mention what we are doing every single day in prayer right now. The enemy must give. He will give. He will break. And so I want to just tell you that on the, on the spiritual warfare side of it, on the personal growth side of this then, is that we have to just keep saying, okay, God, help me to see what is the next thing that I can do to be more effective and to be as salty as I can be, to have effectiveness in being able to touch people and make a difference. And that comes out of these walking through these dimensions and and, and here's, another, here's another flow of information now. This is, this is, I think, a great segue for us right now. This is a great segue for us. I hope this is helping you. Did that help you, what I just said? Mm. You know what? We're going to stop right now, and we're going to thank the Lord that we've been more effective, that we've made more of an impact, and that our prayers are still availing, and we haven't seen the end of what God's going to do yet. I want you to stop, and let's thank him for it right now. Father, I want to thank you. 
I thank you, Lord. We have been more effective. Our prophetic words have, have carried farther. Our apostolic decrees have, have, made, have, have made more inroads. Oh God, our binding and loosing have had, have had a heavenly and, and, and eternal influence upon what's going on in this generation and what's happening in the world today. I thank you, God, for the progress. We don't even know how far we've gone, what we have done, how close we are to the breakthroughs that we're praying for, the revival that we have so craved and desired of you, Father. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the visitation is at hand and that you will get all the praise and you will get all the glory. And so you wait until that moment in which we are so completely surrendered that we don't even care who gets the result, who gets the, the credit or the rewards. We just want the results. We just want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. And so, Lord, we thank you that the enemy's kingdom is coming down, that the enemy is being defeated. We thank you, God, that our prayers are availing, that angels are being released, that armies of angels have been dispatched, and they are pushing back the enemy all the way back to his gates. And I thank you, God, that, that his infrastructure, his, his fake facade that he has put up, this facade that he has created, this narrative that he has built, this, this artificial structure that he has made to try to tell us this is real, to make us think that the Antichrist time is now, God, that has been broken, that has been defeated, and it will be consumed and turned back, oh God, because now is the time, oh God, this is the place, and we are the ones that you have chosen. We stand in the eternal now, in the infinite, and the one emotion of love. We operate in faith, we lay hold upon hope, and we let your perfect love bring us into alignment with you and rhythm with one another in Jesus name. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise. I know you felt that. I know it resonated. I feel the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus name. Don't lose faith in the prayers that you are praying. Now here's a segue for us. What happens when a prince over a city is broken? What happens when a prince over a nation is broken? What happens when a prince is broken? So they have a boundary. They have a, they have a, 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 a legal uh, stopping point that says you can only go this far. So first and foremost, when a prince is defeated, he must live. He must exist in that, in that city and acknowledge his defeat. So as Haman had to walk through the streets of Shushan and he had to acknowledge that he had lost. The enemy he wanted to destroy was being exalted and he was being abased. So he said, this is what is done to the man whom the king delights to honor. He had to go to every street in Shushan. So when a prince is broken, every street on that city, the demons there have to admit that they've been defeated. The principality over that region lives in that city, stays in that city and has to watch the church uh, be exalted while they have to hang on their own gallows. So that's what happens. That's what that's when they're defeated. Now, a secondary situation. So that's on the demonic side. So then there is a seat of authority that is established. What happens? Haman was filling a space. Mordecai now fills the space and sits in the seat of authority that Haman once had. So Haman was given that seat his seat can be taken away. He was given that by those who, who worked for him and those who facilitated his plot and worked along with his conspiracy and accepted um, his leadership. So Satan only has a seat because man gives him that seat. When men turn their hearts towards God, God begins to act and he removes him from that seat and he no longer has a place of influence or power in that region. Instead, it is not the prince over a, a, a city. It is now an angel, which is the counterpart. It's what the captain of the host of heaven said to Joshua. Uh, Take off your shoes where you stand is holy ground. I'm going to bring my armies in the heavens. You bring your army in the earth and you'll take the city. And so I'm giving you the, the, the way for us as the angelic armies to work together to be the opposite of this city and to take this city. So for the church, the church to rule in that area, we must become the exact opposite of whatever that predominant prince is. This is what the Lord told us about Pasadena. Pasadena has the spirit of depression. 
That's been its prince. A couple of years ago now, I was doing a series on dysfunctional families becoming functional. And we did a third session on it. And I woke up that morning and I said, something just changed, God. Matter of fact, it's been changed for a couple of weeks. What is this? What changed? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, the prince of the city has been broken. What remains? Now, here's the clue. What remains are the mentalities, the habits, and lifestyle that has facilitated that prince having his power. All that remains are the mindsets, the habits, the behaviors that gave that prince's power. That's what's left. So in other words, when you are over, when, when that spirit is over you, when a principality is over you, you begin to develop the mindset of depression. You begin to have the habits of depression and you begin to have a lifestyle or behavior of depression. And so we saw three areas where there was depression. It was a three-headed dragon. It was in finance, it was in families, and it was in health. So now when that prince is broken, then what do you see happening from that? Opportunities within the church for people to come and have financial blessing, get jobs, become upwardly mobile, get education, go through new doors of opportunity because they're not in that depressed state anymore. Now they have energy, they believe in themselves, they believe in their potential, know that God is with them. God begins to take the curse off, releases the blessing. We see families start coming back together. Division goes away. They stop self-sabotaging. They start changing their habits, the way they talk to each other, fair fights. Uh, they negotiate, they communicate, and families start coming up and getting healed and being restored. They change their habits. They change the way they talk, okay? Things start to, now there's opportunity for healing, and then finally, health, health issues. When we're not depressed and emotions are not broken down, we don't have all this anger and resentment in us. All those giant emotions create all kinds of stress, which breaks down the body and sickness and disease. Now, all of a sudden, there's healings and miracles that can happen. And lots of faith begins to accelerate. We begin to see, I don't have to be sick. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to be afflicted. I don't have to have a bad marriage. I don't have to be poor the rest of my life. Hey, we can be blessed and we can have more than enough doesn't mean that everyone's going to be millionaires, but God says, I'm going to give you more than enough. And so we begin to speak those and declare those things. And then there's scriptures that go along with that, like Isaiah 61, for example. And I talked about this last week. So what do we mean by this? It's not just breaking the stronghold, but now it's changing. And this is what I want to focus on, the habits, mentalities, and behaviors. So now, now when I'm broken, I, I undo. The Bible says they, they took knowledge of them that they were ignorant and unlearned men, Acts 4.13. They were ignorant and unlearned men, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. There it is. They were ignorant, unlearned men. They said something about this. They should not be functioning on this level. They should not be this smart. They should not be this bold. They should not have this kind of leadership ability. They should not be able to, to mobilize a, an audience. They should not be able to do miracles. They should not have a face that's shining. They shouldn't remind us of Jesus. Jesus has been crucified. Why do these disciples of Jesus act like him and talk like him? and walk? We don't understand this. They had been with Jesus. In other words, they were so eclipsed by Jesus that everything about who they were was completely lost in who they had become. And there was unlimited potential. This is what I want for you. This is what I pray consistently for myself. This is what I desire for our local church. And this is where the, the global church right now, God is, is working in us. He's walking in the midst of the church and he wants us to be free. You see, everything that we need, and I've already said this, I'm tying all the strings together now. Everything we need is already in the church. What's in the world, if I depend upon the world, I'm going to drift away from God. But if, if I understand I don't need anything in the world, 
All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In the will of God, I have everything that I need. In the church, I have everything that I need. In the kingdom are all the resources for abundant life. I just can't always see it. I can't always, as, as a fog... And so my flesh is my fog. My emotion is my fog. The stimulus of the world, and the, that's the fog. So I'm praying, praying to get in alignment for that perfect, perfect eclipse. I want to get there. And when I get to that moment where it falls in place, and oh, there it is. Oh, and if I can have, if I can have 30 minutes where I'm completely aligned, oh, I can move stuff. Brother Barnes used to tell me, he said, I can get more done in 15 minutes than some people can get done in a whole year. Why? Because he had cultivated a relationship with God and he knew when he got into that moment, everything he spoke was going to happen. Brother Stone King told me, there's a place you can get in with God where everything you ask, you get. Where you know everything you ask for, you got it. There's a dimension you can get to. And so I just set out, I'm going to find that place. I want to be able to, I want to be able to get there. I read Glenn Clark and, the, and God's Reach and the seven dimensions. And, and he talks about the seventh dimension is where you are completely one with God. You are completely aligned with God where it's not just that you know the plan. The fifth dimension shows you the pattern and you're living your life according to the pattern. The seventh dimension is you become his will. You become the pattern. You are the dream. You don't just have a dream. You are the dream. It, it, it's your identity. It, it consumes you. It swallows you up. And Jesus said, I and my father are one. We, we've, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. The flesh was so completely, completely engulfed with the father. There was no, there was nothing in him. He said, the prince of this world comes. He's, he's got nothing. There's nothing. It's all God. There's nothing. There's no flesh for the enemy to get his hand on. He, he can't. And so this is where we're going. This is what we're praying towards. And once I get there, sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes it takes fasting and praying for days. Daniel had to take 21 days of fasting to get there. You know, so, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's, it's years of praying to get ourselves in that place where the fog is clear. But once you ever get there, if you ever experience it, if it ever happens, you will never be the same again. Get salty. What does that mean? Have your full potency as a believer because we are this. We don't have salt. We don't throw salt on things. We are salt. That's what Jesus said. Now, let me tell you my story. I promise I was going to tell you. And uh, I started a little late today. I had a, another meeting that went a little over. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this, this story as a, as a close today. And I'm saying this because I want to impart it to you. I want it to be alive to you. I have learned that when I tell my stories and I'm being obedient because the Lord told me to tell my stories now. When I tell my stories, it gives not insight to me. That's not the goal. It gives insight into how he works. And it shows that if he would do it for me, he would do it for anybody. So I had a thought come to me. As a young preacher, I had seen demon-possessed people before. And I said, God, I want to be possessed with you. If it's fair to be possessed by the devil, it's fair to be possessed by you. So long story short, for a period of days, I began to pray, total surrender, total surrender. Consume me, God, consume me, God, consume me, God. I want you to swallow me up. I want you to take over me. I want you to take over my, I, 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 I want them to take note that I've been with Jesus. I quoted that verse. I want, them, I, I want them to see Jesus in my face. I want them to hear him in my words. It's the prayer that we opened our broadcast with today. This is when I first found those prayers. I discovered those prayers. I began to pray those prayers. Don't let them see me. Let them see you. I, I want to be completely taken over. I don't want nothing to stand in the way. And I remember the Lord said to me, I need your permission one more time. And I thought, oh boy, he said, I'm going to do it, but I need your permission one more time. And I thought, wow, if I'm actually hearing his voice, he's actually speaking it now. It's not just a prayer that I'm praying. It's not a future promise that's going to be fulfilled. It's a present provision that's about to happen now. I started to tremble and shake and I, 
I was nervous. I, 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 and I thought, oh my goodness, um, I, I, I don't want to embarrass myself, but I hid behind a spiritual veil just a little bit. And I said, God, I don't want to embarrass you. Let me not do anything that will embarrass you. I don't want to embarrass you. And then I realized I was actually saying, I don't want to embarrass myself. And so I said, okay, okay. I said, as long as I give you glory, whatever they think about me doesn't matter. Yes, you have my permission. And I saw a picture of an old fashioned uh, like camera with a light, the, the old uh, light bulb at the camera, and, it, and, it, and it, the old fashioned kind where they, it would be a big bright flash. And I saw a picture of a camera. He was like, this is going to be, like there's going to be pictures. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna be in memory. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. I said, okay, God, but, okay, God, but, this is, isn't this what you want? Isn't it what you want? You want them not to see me, but them to see you. And whatever you want to do, do, God. And so I came and preached a couple days later. I want to say it was the next day or the day after. It was very shortly after this conversation I had. And at the end of the service, and I was praying before the service. I mean, I'd been praying hours every day. And, and I came into this service, and I was just so determined that God was going to do something great in that service. And I was going to I was going to preach and release faith and encourage the people. And we had a good service, but it, it never quite got there. Uh, after the service was over, the anointing did not leave. I got in the car. It got stronger. We got to the restaurant. It was so strong. I couldn't sit in my seat. I ordered my spaghetti or whatever it was. And there was a bunch of us in the back room of this restaurant. And I just got up and they thought, you know, I, I had a good time with these, with these people. They've been with me for, we've been together for a while. And I said, man, I just feel like praying for somebody. Well, you know, they thought I was just kind of being exuberant and they just said, well, go pray for her. And I said, okay. And so I just walked over. And when I looked at her, I immediately knew she was really struggling. And I hadn't prayed for her in the service. So I prayed for her right there in the restaurant. And then God gave me words for her. And, and wow. And then she's crying. And everyone's like, oh, that was really cool. Wow. Like God's moving in the restaurant. And so I sat down. Here comes another one. Next thing I know, I got a line. I got a line of people lining up to get prayer. I get to the fourth one. Each one I would have a word, something to say to them, something to pray over them. The last one was the fourth one I prayed for. And I just said, I said, you have a lot of joy that's been held up inside of you. It's been pent up for years. I said, because of something that happened to you when you were young. And I said, you've been carrying this around. I said, I just want you to say one phrase for me. I forgive my father. And she said, I forgive my father. And the tears squirted out of her eyes. And I, I kid you not, they did not just come, they squirted. And then all of a sudden I said, now Lord, for all the years of grief, she has forgiven, she has released her father, now release the joy. And I mean, when God released the joy, she got so full of the Holy Ghost, she was completely drunk, she could not stand up. It took four women to try to keep her from falling over. And I said, why don't we take this to the church? And everyone got up to start to clap and they went, oh my goodness, we're in a restaurant, we can't clap in the restaurant. So they all tried to pay really fast. And they got trying to get that lady out and they were all slowly going out to trying to get out the door and paying. I was in the back room and I was just still feeling the Holy Ghost. It was so strong in me. It was, it did not let up. And I thought, my God, here we are. We're not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but one o'clock at night. Well, well, I guess a lot of people would be drunk at one o'clock. And I said, well, Lord, zeal with knowledge, zeal with knowledge, because I feel a whole lot of zeal right now. I won't get up on the chair and preach in the restaurant because I don't want to disrupt this place and, and give a bad witness for this pastor. I said, but whoever talks to me, God, I'll know I'm supposed to talk to them. So I walked down this and I just was looking at people. I'm walking down and I'm just waiting for someone to say something. They're all just looking up from their soup saying, who's this guy? What's he doing? And then finally I come around the corner. Here comes a lady. She said, oh, that was really wonderful what happened back there. I said, yes, it was. And she said, this is my friend, Frank. And I looked at Frank and immediately I knew he had an emphysema and that he had been smoking for a long time. And I looked at him and I said, Frank, do you, are you ready to get rid of those cigarettes? Are you ready? Are you ready to be healed in your lungs? And she goes, I just told him that. I just talked. I said, how long have you been smoking, Frank? He said, 22 years. I said, how about this be your last day? I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I'm ready right now. And I prayed with him right there. And God helped me lead him through a prayer of repentance right in the restaurant. I invited him to the service. And I thought, man, this is so great. I was able to do what I've never done before. That was so awesome. I was praying with people I've never met before in a restaurant. I walk outside the door. 
They were literally dancing all over the parking lot. People were drunk in the spirit in their cars. Some of them had the door open, half of the leg in, half of half the other side, other side of their body is out of the car, half of it in the car, one leg in, one leg out. I mean, some of them got the car started, but never couldn't put it in, put it in drive. And there was picking in tongues. Drunk started coming in because it was a 24 hour place. They started coming in. They started wondering, what on earth are you doing? They're kind of staggering because they're drunk and we're staggering because they're full of the Holy Ghost. And we're using, they didn't have really good lighting out there. We're using somebody's lighter and we're teaching Bible studies for an hour in the parking lot talking to people. But God still wasn't done. We finally got back to the church and the glory of God falls in the church. And then I got completely drunk in the spirit and I fell out on the floor and I danced and, 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 and I cried and I spoke in tongues. It was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. It was so far out of my comfort zone. It was so far out of my uh, embarrassment place that, I mean, God, God completely stripped me of pride. I had had this guy, and I, I hate to even say it, but he kind of danced funny when, when we were growing up and we were kind of teenagers. We had kind of we had kind of laughed at him a little bit because he would spin around in a circle. We used to call him Whirly Bird. And, oh, there goes Whirly Bird again. We just kind of chuckle. Um, and, I mean, God, you know what God did to me? He said, all right, you're going to make fun of somebody to worship like that? You're going to do the Whirly Bird. And, I mean, I did Whirly Bird for, I, I don't know how long. I did it till all my pride was gone. And then I fell out on the floor laughing. I was a complete fool in the sense of, of, of the natural, but in the spiritual, um, I had never been more submitted in my life. The next day, the next day, the pastor did not want to go back to the restaurant. He was actually a little bit concerned. <laughs> I understand as a pastor now, I understand. Me as an evangelist, I was on fire. So I prayed it again. God, just completely keep going. Keep going. Take us further. Take us further. Take us further. Do more, God. Pour out your spirit. This is revival. We're doing revival. This is like Azusa Street. This is like stories that I've read about. We're having them right now, God. And the pastor says, we're just going to go through a drive through tonight. And I said, okay. Okay. No problem. And I got, and I said, God, we are not going to be ashamed. We're not going to be embarrassed. I lift my hands and I said, God, do it in the line right now. Do it in the drive through in the name of Jesus. I put my hand down. I kid you not. The horn behind me honked because the Holy Ghost hit that car and, and they, uh, they leaned on the horn, speaking in tongue, fell over on the horn and the horn was going, ah. And we all turned around and then they were speak, finally leaned back, speaking in tongues. They couldn't order. They came to the, welcome to water. Blah, blah, blah. Can, can, I take, can I take your order? And it was like, so, la, 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 la. And they were speaking in tongues. There was only one girl that could speak English. You want a hamburger? Like, I don't care. You know, They were all completely drunk out of their mind. Every car was, was full of the Holy Ghost. They're going through the drive through line. The people are looking out the little window going, what on earth? The employees in the, what is happening? We're going by the window and they're seeing us so full of the Holy Ghost right there. We get back to the house. Pastor drives me to the house. I walk in. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost so strong. People couldn't even make it from their car. They were dancing on the sidewalk trying to get to the house. Finally, we get all in there and then it totally changed, completely changed. The environment completely changed. And we went into something so deep and it was so powerful and yet it was so peaceful. And I had just kept saying, God, I want to be possessed by you. I want you to take over me. God, I just want you to, I just, I just got to get past myself, God. I know there's more. There's a place beyond this. There's a place. Be and they all just suddenly sat in a hush and they were eating their sandwiches and we ate for a few minutes and they were all just, all of a sudden they all just turned and looked at me. Well, when are you going to speak? And I got up in the living room with about, I think it was about 18 of us in this little, in this living room. And I stood up and Jesus came and stood next to me. I felt, I felt a physical presence. I'm going to stand next to me. And I said, no, not next to me, Lord. In me. And I felt like someone just stepped right in. I felt my face change. I felt my voice change. My personality changed. I suddenly became very calm. I'm normally a 
pretty energetic and I was very calm. And suddenly I just began to say, what was Jesus like when he was 29? Right before he started his ministry, what was he like? What happened to him? What was his, what was his life as a carpenter in his last year? And then I just started describing scenarios and I just started thinking about that. And I was telling all of, all of us in the room, all the people in the room, you know, we may be in that year right before we begin whatever he has for us. We might be right there. Well, what was Jesus like? What was he like? And I got a card from one of the ladies that was there that night and we prayed in such a powerful, intimate way. I, I, I talked about just Jesus. And I talked about the transition when he transitioned into that role of, of being Messiah and, and, and doing his father's will. And I can do nothing but what I hear my father say and see my father do. And I talked about just being lost in him, being one with him. And I was just talking about his perfect love and how that compassion motivated his life. And, and I just felt completely completely lost in him. I would stop and just look at people and talk to them and suddenly I would know what to tell them. I would know exactly what to say to them. I, 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 I talked, I just, it, it, was, it, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It was so not me. It was so much what I'd been praying for and what I wanted. And then finally, I just stepped back and said, it's just gotta be him all by himself. And I just found my own place on the floor in my own position of worship. And I just worshiped and worshiped and worshiped. And we got lost in the presence of God again. I got a little card, someone gave me a little card from that night and the lady said, I saw something tonight that I've never seen before. When I looked at you, I didn't see you. I saw Jesus's face and I felt his love. It was not you. It was him. And when she wrote that to me, that became the high water mark. This is the goal. Not you were a great preacher. Wow, you're so well prepared. Not, man, that was anointed or the way you tied it up at the end was great or wow, it was so cool how people got, got healed tonight. Well, we sure got the devil on the run. Those are all wonderful compliments. Thank you. Thank you for anyone, you know, I, I'll be thankful for anyone that would say those things. But to say, I saw Jesus, that's the ultimate. Because folks, I'm flawed. I'm flawed. There's so many things that need to improve in my life, so many ways that I need to get better, so many things about me that are undeserving that are not good. I know that in me, that in my flesh dwells no good thing. But Jesus, Jesus, eclipse me, Lord. If I get 10 minutes of being eclipsed, if I can have a half hour, if I can have, if I can have a day where I'm completely one with you, it's enough to change the world. All of us today, I wonder what would happen if all of us could get into that dimension of being lost in the love of God. I'm taking my glasses off right now because I need to wipe my tears. My nose is starting to run. But also, I'm not gonna be able to see your comments either because it's not about your comments right now. It's about his presence. Let's close with this. Jesus, what do you want from us, Lord? What do you want from me, Jesus? I want to be the moon to your sun. I want to be the reflection of you. I have no light of my own. I have no luminescence without you. I have no worth or value. All is vanity. Vanity of vanities and vexation of spirit. It's all emptiness. 
We're like chaff in the wind. We're all unprofitable servants without you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Do what only you could do. Raise up the people that no one would expect. You took a man named Ananias who was just a saint that was persecuted, that was running from Saul. He didn't have a pedigree. He wasn't an apostle. He didn't know the apostles as family members or didn't have any special privilege. He just knew you and you appeared to Ananias. You appeared to him and used him to baptize the greatest apostle of his generation, one of the greatest men of God that's ever lived. You took someone unusual from our perspectives, but for you, you knew exactly who to talk to because you knew that he would listen. Oh Lord, I pray, raise up from amongst this generation friends, friends of God like Abraham, people that you will sit down with and talk to you, people that will walk with you, Jesus. Oh God, a testimony so long ago is great. And I thank you, Lord, for the possibilities that you showed me. Oh Lord, I cannot live on the past. I cannot live that one day, years ago, I was able to be transparent enough. I was invisible enough. I was submitted enough. I was yielded enough. <laughs> At one time, people saw you in my faith. And I want it to be that all of us, on a daily basis, on a consistent basis, that they take knowledge of us that we've been with you. That we are true Christians. We are true Christ followers, Christ imitators. <laughs> Oh God, what would happen if the millions upon millions of people who are filled with your spirit would suddenly walk in that same place, in that same dimension? What would happen to our local church? What would happen to me, Father? How would my life be more pleasing to you? And how would your kingdom come? And how would your will be done? if I was completely eclipsed by you today. In Jesus' name. I thank you for your people. I thank you for these awesome people. Oh, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. It is my honor, oh God, to pray with them. My honor to know them. Missionaries, intercessors, people in the front, front lines fighting and warring and praying. They're in Germany and Portugal and Spain and fighting it out in Amsterdam, working hard in Jordan and the United Arab Emirates, others that cannot even come online, Lord Jesus, that may watch on YouTube and uh, Philippines or India, or they're fighting it, fighting it out, oh God. In Africa somewhere, oh God, the world is not worth it. The world is not worth it. I thank you, God, for these states across the United States where there are faithful intercessors in, in such adversity and such oppression, Lord. And they give praise to your name. They faithfully walk with you and serve you in Canada and Mexico, Central America, South America, the islands of the sea, Australia, oh God. All over the world, there are intercessors, people right here, oh God. People, oh God, that you know, people that you love. I thank you. We don't just know you, but you know us. Oh God, I pray, let your light shine. Let people take knowledge of us, of me, that I've been with you. In Jesus' name.
In Jesus' name. My beloved friends, brothers and sisters, men and women of God, we love you. Thank you for praying with us today. I will leave you to continue on as the Lord so leads you. God bless you. And remember, don't stay or live in the shadow of what's coming. Live in the light of fulfillment in Christ. In Jesus' name. This has been our High Noon Broadcast.